As global temperatures break records, the US and China's climate envoys meet in Beijing. But political disputes have stopped talks between the world's top two polluters. So can they find common ground? And will developed nations help more vulnerable ones adapt to climate change? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The US and China have restarted stalled talks on climate change, just as some of the world swelters in record-breaking heat, as others suffer catastrophic flooding. The need for urgent action is long known, but what isn't is who'll take responsibility for the damage and for healing the environment. Developing nations say the developed world has had free reign to use fossil fuels and pollute for much of the time since the Industrial Revolution. Poorer nations say they're being asked to pay for the impact when richer countries are more to blame. We'll be discussing these arguments and more in just a few moments with our guests. But first, Katrina Yu reports now from Beijing on the US-China meeting. John Kerry is visiting China as the country grapples with its most severe heat wave on record. During his four days here, he'll meet with climate envoy from China, Xie Jianhua, for a series of talks, and they will discuss reducing emissions, particularly methane, and curbing deforestation and the use of coal. The U.S. says it's imperative that Beijing and Washington take the lead on this issue, as the world's biggest polluters and emitters of greenhouse gases, as well as the fact that both countries are currently addicted to the use of fossil fuels. Now, China China has pledged to reduce its coal consumption, but not until 2026, and it has in recent years accelerated approvals for coal-related projects. Now, Washington has criticized Beijing for its climate record and says China should pay into global funds to help poorer countries fight global warming. Now, while Beijing says it supports a fund for wealthy nations such as the United States to pay for climate-related damages and loss, it does not want to pay into these funds itself because it counts China as a developing country still. Now, U.S.-China climate cooperation has suffered in recent years due to a range of political and economic disagreements, but analysts say that both sides must set aside these differences in order to address the climate crisis efficiently. For Inside Story, Katrina Yu in Beijing. Well, John Kerry has said that under no circumstances would the U.S. pay climate reparations to developing countries affected by climate-related disasters. At a summit in Paris last month, wealthy nations did agree a $100 billion package to help developing nations adapt. But that's well short of what the U.N. says is needed. A U.N.-backed report last year concluded that developing countries need to spend around $1 trillion a year within the next two years, and that didn't include China. The report says that an investment of $2.4 trillion will be needed every year from 2030 to help countries in the developing world cope with climate change. It also argues that rich countries have severely impacted developing ones with high levels of emissions and should pick up half the cost. The rest should come from domestic sources in developing countries to help prepare the environment and limit damage. So let's bring in our guests from London. We're joined by Salim Mulhook, who is director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development, a research organisation based in Bangladesh. From Dakar, we're joined by Uli Keita, executive director of Greenpeace Africa. And also in London is Asad Rehman, the executive director of War on Want, an anti-poverty charity which partners with social movements in the Global South. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, Salima, let's uh, start with you. As you heard there, John Kerry said that under no circumstances would the US pay reparations to developing nations affected by climate change. Uh, should the US and other developed nations be forced to do so? And if so, by whom? Well, first of all, my message for Mr Kerry is that he should worry about his own citizens in Texas and Las Vegas and in Nevada who are now suffering from extreme heat impacts under the heat dome that the United States of America is suffering from. And then in Vermont from flooding that is taking place. These are all impacts of human-induced climate change causing losses and damages to the citizens of the United States and the bill and they are paying for it themselves right now. 
the bill is going to be in the billions and possibly even in the trillions to the United States of America, to his own citizens. So he needs to be worrying about what he's going to do to protect them and only after that figure out what he can do to help the rest of the world, which under the United Nations Framework Convention and the agreement we made in COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, they have agreed to do. They are not paying reparations, they are paying solidarity funds, and all countries have agreed to put money into that fund. Salim, well, uh, Bangladesh, of course, well used to dealing with the, the effects, the impacts of climate change already, with, with, as you say, the climate in the US becoming more erratic with, with heat waves, uh, uh, more destructive tornadoes, the flooding you mentioned, wildfires, uh, uh, and with that impacting more and more people, do you think that, uh, that, that citizens of the US will, uh, are becoming more mindful of the impact of, of climate change now and will demand uh, more uh, from their government? Well, they're certainly being affected. To, the, uh, to what extent they realize that it's human-induced climate change uh, remains to be seen because the fossil fuel industry in the U.S. has done a very, very good job at keeping its own citizens ignorant of what the climate change impacts are. But increasingly, they are realizing it, and particularly young people in the U.S. certainly are far more aware of the impacts of human-induced climate change and the fact that they are suffering because of global temperature rise of well, well over 1.1 degree that has already occurred, and we are headed to 1.5 in the next few years. So these are going to get worse, and no country is prepared, including rich countries like the United States of America, and everybody's going to have to be better prepared at dealing with those impacts. In the climate change jargon, we call it adaptation, adapting to them. You mentioned Bangladesh. My country is one of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change and has been adapting to those impacts. So we are quite well prepared. We're still going to be impacted. They're going to cause a lot of harm. But by being better prepared, we can minimize what we call losses and damages from climate change. Being unprepared is going to maximize losses and damages from climate change. And the U.S. is in that situation. They are unprepared and therefore suffering a lot more. Uli, how closely will African nations be following these discussions in Beijing? Well, you know, Greenpeace, at Greenpeace Africa, we strongly support the loss and damage fund, which we know was agreed upon with all of the international stakeholders at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. And so um, just to add to what my predecessor said, we actually do um, understand that Kerry has clarified that he did not mean that they wouldn't pay, that the U.S. wouldn't pay into the loss and uh, damage fund, but rather that they won't be admitting to the liability, which we disagree with. We think everybody who is polluting should be held accountable and should definitely uh, be held liable for the damages causing into uh, the global environmental space. So while we support the demands of, say, our continents, our African governments for loss and damage, uh, for payments and adaptation and mitigation finance, we also are demanding that our own African governments and businesses who are polluting, um, who are exploiting, to lead in adopting the right policies and practices and lead by example. So at Greenpeace Africa, the African countries need not to try to follow the destructive pathways of development um, that the Global North countries did, but rather we are asking that the path be based away from extractivism, which is clearly manifested itself as a resource curse across the global south and as a climate crisis that affects the entire human species. So this is what we are working towards, and we hope that we'll be in Dubai at COP29 there and uh, voice our, our uh, concerns. Asa, to what extent is it hypocritical of John Kerry to be going to China for talks uh, when the U.S. itself continues to expand its own uh, fossil fuel industries? Well, it's deeply immoral and outrageous. And we have to remember, um, you know, even the word climate reparations, it's not simply about paying compensation for the damage that can't be repaired. It's also about doing no more harm and repairing the harm that you have caused. And the U.S., is responsible about, for about a quarter of all the historic emissions. Europe, about 22%. And 
the US is still planning one of the biggest fossil fuel expansions globally, along with the European Union, Australia and others. So it's a case of uh, do as I say, not what I do. And, and of course, consumption, um, the overconsumption of that carbon budget uh, that Celine talked about, the critical one we have to keep well below 1.5, has been calculated. And it's, I mean, it's an immense figure. It's about 170 trillion, with the US liable for about 80 trillion of that, uh, what some would call carbon colonialism. So, you know, the scale of the problem and what is being offered by particularly rich countries who are the most responsible, it's just a drop in the ocean. We have the UN saying that adaptation would need between 300 billion by 20, a year by 2030 to about 500 billion a year by 2050. And we've got to remember that at the moment, you know, the, the promise of even 100 billion has not been met. Um, that was promised back in 2007 in the US currently offers about a 1 billion to the Green Climate Fund. And let's put that into perspective. At this, in the same time, the US is approving about 877 billion for its military spending. So I think the reality between, you know, what is the need, what is the crisis, and we only need to, as Salim said, take a step back. The world is boiling. We see temperatures breaching 50 degrees in many, many countries. But the key differences between the rich countries and the poorer countries is rich countries feel that they've got the capacity and the resources to be able to address this crisis, whilst, of course, poorer countries aren't, because they're not just dealing with a climate crisis, they're dealing with uh, a crisis of poverty and inequality, they're still recovering from the COVID pandemic, and now, of course, faced a, a cost of living crisis, so much so that they are paying more in debt uh, five times more in debt than they are spending on climate. So they're trapped into a global economic system of unfair tax, trade and debt, largely shaped by the US and rich countries. So it's not simply about that the US not putting up money. It's actually locking poorer countries in to a pathway which makes it unab them unable to be able to develop cleanly. What we really need at this moment is a framework of solidarity and cooperation, technology being shared, finance being given so people can develop cleanly. That's why we as War on Want call for a global Green New Deal, together with many movements across the global south. But, but as, as I said, who's, who's going to pay for it? Kenya's president, William Ruto, uh, has called for the establishment of a, of a global green bank to assist developing nations uh, as they try to mitigate the effects of climate change without exacerbating their already... Unsta unsustainable levels of, of, of debt. Is, is that a good idea? Is that not something that, that the World Bank and the IMF should be doing, for instance? Well, the problem is many of these international institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank, they're dominated by rich country interests. And in fact, that they have been overwhelmingly responsible for fueling much of the dirty development pathways. They have locked in developing countries into economic systems which say you have to open your economy, you can't build resilience in your economy, you have to privatise everything. Uh, it's just a misguided and a failed approach. I think what many developing country leaders, and it's not just the president of Kenya, we've heard it from Prime Minister of, Baham, uh, of, uh, uh, of Barbados, for the Brazilian President Lula, they're talking about we need to really fix the global economy so that it's more fairer and more equitable, and that it puts climate and tackling poverty at its centre. Now, there are lots of different approaches that can be done. We could actually tax the corporations who are responsible for this damage much better. We could uh, fix our trade system. We could tax the wealthy billionaires who have been overwhelmingly the ones who have benefited the most from these f forms of crisis and exploitation. Their wealth is is growing exponentially whilst the majority of the world see their their, their their everyday income falling. So there are many, many solutions. What we lack is political will. And the problem we have is, as John Kerry was saying to the US Senate, um, we have the, the both, not just in the United States, but across Europe, political leaders who are looking at their domestic circumstances and basically saying, we are no longer able to provide the solidarity, the cooperation, or pay our fair share. And this isn't about justice. It's fundamentally about justice. If you burn down somebody's home, you have to be the ones that pay to be it, to, for it to be fixed. And that's what rich countries don't want to do. And that's the real question about liability that the US wants to avoid. Salimo, I, I see you nodding your head there. Do is is, you agree with, with, with what uh, Asad is saying? 
Indeed, I do. And, and let me just uh, take it a, a bit further in terms of the argument. No, climate change is a global problem. And we have, un unfortunately, just in the last few days, in the first week of July, on the 3rd of July, we had the hottest temperature the world has ever seen. And then a day later, on the 4th of July, that record got broken. And then two days later, on the 6th of July, the record got broken again. So we have very clearly crossed into the threshold of losses and damages from the impacts of human-induced climate change. And it's a global problem that everybody in the world, every country in the world is going to have to face. And unfortunately, both the economic systems that we have at the global level, as well as the security systems, as Asad mentioned, the United States military that absorbs enormous amounts of funds is actually not at all prepared to deal with the climate problem, which is going to be their number one security problem going forward. Indeed, in fact, the, U the U.S. military is probably one of the biggest polluters because of the emissions of greenhouse gases associated with its activities. So not, as, not only is it not fit for purpose yeah. for the new security regime that the global whole world is going to have to face, this is not country against country, this is the world against climate change, okay. and we are not ready for it. So and we need to change the way we do things. So, Salima, when um, uh, John Kerry warned in Beijing that the U.S. and China are running out of time to avert a harrowing future, is, is what he said, uh, to what extent is it already too, too late for that, that we've passed the tipping point here? The future is now about mitigating uh, the effects. Asad, I can see you shaking your head. I'll, I'll come back to you in just a moment. But, <laughs> but just quickly, Salima, because I, I want to bring you early back into the discussion. Sure. So... We, we have to work at two timescales. The immediate emergency crisis timescale is dealing with the impacts of climate change that are happening all over the world, but primarily on poor people living in poor countries. But in the longer term, we need to be preventing the globally catastrophic temperature increases for which we are headed if we don't take actions on mitigation. So okay. we're going to have to chew gum and walk at the same time. And, and Asad, just, just very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. We have to chew gum and walk, walk at the same time. Look, it's never too late because what we're talking about is the scale of the impacts. And we know that we have to limit temperatures well below 1.5 degrees. And that's not a target. That's already recognising that global warming and increased temperatures is already deadly for many people and is devastating people's lives and livelihoods. It gets exponentially worse and worse and it becomes harder and harder to fix. So every degree that we shave off is, is millions of lives uh, that we've saved and, uh, and, and, and prevented from being facing this kind, kind of uh, climate violence. So it's never too late. The question really is now is rich countries need to cut their emissions fairly which does mean that they should be at zero carbon by 2030 at the, at the least, so that poorer countries have got a little bit more time to be able to cut their emissions. We need to be at zero carbon by 2050, and we need the finance and technology. It's fundamentally, if you want poorer countries to be able to move away from the data consumption development pathways, you've got to be able to support them. If you don't, you're going to lock half the world into poverty and inequality, and that's simply not acceptable. Uli, uh, for years, developed nations have warned developing nations against the use of uh, fossil fuels. They've routinely denied them loans for oil and gas projects, for instance. Now we've got Germany reopening coal-fired power stations, European nations granting energy consumption subsidies and calling on African nations to ramp up their production of, of, of natural gas uh, for export. How is... This, these, these apparent, how are these apparent double standards being viewed there in Africa? It's viewed very negatively. Uh, my predecessor called it justice. It's all about the climate justice. You know, at Greenpeace Africa, what we're trying to do now is to develop global iconic campaigns. Uh, there's one of them, which is called Stop Drilling and Start Paying, or Make Polluters Pay, which is really about climate justice. You know, this, this campaign is, is targeting holding the extravities accountable and stopping them in their tracks. We need people, big polluters, to pay for the damage they're causing to the world. So in South Africa, for example, we have confronted big polluters such as ESCOM and Shell on their polluting business model, which will continue to drive a shift in mindset um, from the fossil fuel independence to 
um, more of a, a renewable energy. So we are holding polluters accountable for oil spills, like the worst environmental disaster, as you've seen um, in Mauritius uh, in July, three years ago. This is one of the things that we are pushing back in Africa. We campaign to stop oil and gas uh, development in countries like the DRC, like in Cameroon, in Nigeria, in many of the African countries. So we're all about pushing back. We're all about stopping these polluters and these governments um, drilling and start paying. And uh, if we want to really build a climate justice movement across the globe, we need to now start to really hold people accountable. Okay, this is yeah. something that we are big on but, in, but in I, Greenpeace Africa, and we're going to push it across the continent. What, but, but really, when you talk about the, this climate justice movement, I mean, who needs to take the lead here? This can't be down to, to grassroots organizations, can it? I mean, this needs, a, this needs someone or something to take the lead here and, and bang, uh, you know, politicians' heads together on this issue. Yes, I mean, uh, President Rudolf said it very well. He said, climate action is not a global north issue or global south issue. It's our collective challenge and it affects all of us, which is true. So we need to come together to find common global solution. And this is why I appreciate um, the African governments now taking accountability, now trying to have the political will together as the African Union. They are now organizing something called the Africa Climate Summit. Just, this is big. This is the first time the African governments, all of them, are coming together to champion climate change, to have a roadmap for climate change. And with the expectation of escalating climate crisis in terms of the frequency and intensities, urgent action is required for us to mitigate these challenges. So it's, it's taken, as you rightly said, somebody needs to take decision. Somebody needs to be bold and ambitious. Somebody needs to be accountable. If governments are starting to really put their heads together and speak as one and say, this is serious. We need to put our resources. We need to put our technical know-how. We need to put all of our resources in order to mitigate some of these challenges for our people, for the global, or get yeah. global entity as okay. the world that we are then we would have solutions to this climate change. I, 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 Salim and, and, and us are both nodding. Let's come to Salim first. Uh, you, you, you were in agreement there. Absolutely. I think, you know, what uh, Uli said is that it, we need to be changing our mindset from leaders just thinking about their own countries, which is what John Kerry was reflecting when he responded to a, a senator in the Senate, to thinking about being citizens of planet Earth and all of us being in the same planet Earth ship facing a common problem, a common enemy, if you like, that is attacking the entire planet. And our leaders, unfortunately, simply have not been able to shift the paradigm in which they think. They just think about national interests in very short term terms. And those are not going to help us in the long run. OK, as I said, I mean, to what extent is this is this wishful thinking, though, about, about this, this global leadership, and that there are too many vested interests here, people who politically don't see eye to eye to agree on anything? Look, we, we, we have a global framework. It's in, we have a global treaty. We have the UN Convention on Climate Change. We have the climate, uh, the COP and the climate summits. But reality is, you know, for, uh, look, if you are in the US and your per capita emissions is about 14 tonnes per individual, and that's seven times India's, and the majority of people in, in the continent of Africa have got a negligible footprint, it's very, very difficult for developing countries to say, look, how much more do you want us to do without resources and support? Yep. Half the world currently is locked into poverty, denied even access to electricity and clean cooking. People need those things. The real question is, until the United States, the European Union, the UK and others come to the table and recognise that they have a responsibility, they've caused the most damage, they have to cut their own emissions, they have to stop this expansion of fossil fuels, but they also have to recognise that the wealth that they've taken from the Global South and continue to take from the Global South. Look, it's calculated since 1960 to this present moment that close to $152 trillion in wealth okay. has been taken out of the Global South to the North. Basically, developing countries need support. 
and yep. rich countries have got the capacity and got the wealth to be able to do it. So it needs a collective effort, but it's rich countries who are the main block here. All right. Uh, and S Salima, it, 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 I, I just wonder, you've got John Kerry at the moment in, in Beijing talking to, to China, another of the, the world's biggest polluters. In terms of, of sheer population size, though, and an expanding economy, um, where does India fit into this picture? If John Kerry's in Beijing talking to them about climate, um, shouldn't he be in New Delhi? Absolutely. I think, you know, China and the U.S. are certainly the two countries as countries that matter with respect to the emissions of greenhouse gases. China has been overtaking the U.S. recently as the biggest emitter. But India isn't very far behind and needs to be brought into the, the picture. There's going to be a summit of the G20 countries very soon hosted by India, where hopefully they will take this issue on board and all the G20, the, the biggest economies around in the world, will take this issue forward and, and deal with it. The good news is that both in China and India, they are realizing that they have more to gain by transitioning away from fossil fuels into cleaner energy, because mm. they are both vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In fact, China is extremely okay. vulnerable. They're having heat waves right now as we speak. OK. Uli, uh, uh, we're almost out of time. Um, uh, one final thought from you. Are you at all hopeful? Is there any um, room for optimism here that the worst effects of climate change can still be avoided? Or do you think that we've actually passed the tipping point, that, that all of this is too little, too late? It's now about mitigating, uh, mitigation. No, I'm hopeful. I think uh, countries such as African countries right now are only... They, they're realising that if, although they're minuscule contributors to global emissions... But within just several decades, in tandem with positive changes in population growth and decline of poverty, some forecasts are actually saying that emissions from the continent will match those of India today. So imagine if that happens. They, they're realizing that we need to have resources in place. We need to invest in this. So mm. it's a global issue. It affects all of us. So I'm, I'm now very hopeful to see that the Africans are coming together as African Union to address the climate change through the Africa Climate Summit. So I'm very hopeful. It's never too late. We can do more. Thank you so much to, to all of you. It's been great to talk to you today. Samuel, uh, Salim al uh Uli Keita and uh, Asad uh, Rehman. Um, as always, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time by going to the website. We're at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join this conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here at Doha. We'll see you again. Bye for now.